do. Hello and good morning. Let me double check the audio. The audio looks good. Welcome to uh, Machine Learning and Natural Language Processing Coffee Chat for the week. I'm Dr. Rachel Chapman, and my YouTube channel slash uh, podcast, if you're listening to this as a podcast, is for anyone who cares about language technology and other people. Um, and I'm going to try something a little bit different today. Uh, so I reduced the number of things that I'm going to talk about dramatically. Uh, for those of you who are coffee supporters, um, the links went out earlier this morning, and you also have the links of all the stuff that I took out to talk about. Um, but... Three hours is way too long, <laughs> so uh, I am going to try and keep this under two hours and we'll see how we do. Um, and I've also reorganized stuff a little bit, so we're going to start with professional things, you know, news, announcements, etc. that's relevant to folks working in, in machine learning and natural language processing technology. Uh, and then we're going to talk about politics, so law. <laughs> um, one thing I'm not going to talk about today but did happen yesterday is that the Digital Services Act is now in effect. Uh, so those of you who are working with data of EU citizens, that's going to be um, uh, relevant to you. Uh, and then we're going to talk about closer to the end research and some papers. Uh, and then finally, we end with a little bit of fun to end on a high note. Uh, and just as a note, so it is currently November 17th, uh, 2022. Next Thursday, there will be no coffee chat. It's a holiday in the US, which is where I am, and I am taking the holiday. So if you're also in the US, enjoy your holiday. Uh, and if you are not, uh, check out one of the many other videos on my YouTube channel, I guess. All right, let's hop in. Oh, one sec. Uh, YouTube keeps hiding some comments from me, uh, and I think I fixed it now. So professional stuff. Starting off here, uh, so this is just a cool little data utility I ran across. Uh, it is a data matcher. Uh, and I'll pop the, the link in the chat here, uh, Simon W, S I M O N W dot GitHub dot IO slash data matcher. Uh, it uses, uh, you know, edit distance, love and shine distance uh, to suggest things that are close uh, and maybe, in fact, the same thing, right? Um, so it's not quite a duplicate detector. It's to identify things like, you know, typos, etc. Uh, so just a little little JavaScript app uh, that you can step through if you have a little bit of data that you need to match. So seemed cool and useful. Uh, and I believe it is also open source. So you can you can check out the code if you like. Uh, next up, also in this, oh, well, <laughs> uh, it's a Bloomberg article that you we can't read together, uh, but I'll give you the sort of the general gist. Uh, so the Bloomberg article is from November 10th. It's by Katerina Katrina, K-A-T-R-I-N-A, -A, Manson, um, Manson, Manson, probably Manson, right? Uh, from Bloomberg, and it is titled Spyware Tied to China Targets Apps Used by Uyghurs, Cybersecurity Firm uh, says. So I want to talk about this because uh, it is really focusing on Uyghur language apps and apps about the language, Uyghur language. And I do know that that is uh, not the uh, you know, m most correct pronunciation, you know, based on the, the language, but it is the general pronunciation that um, people use here in the US. So apologies uh, if um, it sounds very wrong to you. And for those of you who are listening, uh, that is spelled U-Y-G-H-U-R. Uh, so it was found in apps including uh, Uyghur dictionaries and keyboards, um, and it appears to be potentially state-sponsored, question mark, hard to say, uh, malware that is in all of these apps uh, that is sending personal information uh, from people who are using these apps to somewhere, question mark. Um, so. I wanted to bring this up because sometimes you hear people talk about, you know, uh, data science for good or NLP for good, et cetera. Uh, and I would say that this sort of, um, you know, intentional surveillance of a language community, I would call uh, eh, not that. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe data science for malicious uses, et cetera. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, next up. Uh, we have, so this is a news article that is talking about a research project. Um, it's from MIT Technology Review. The article is by Melissa 
Hekila, Hekila. I'm pretty sure that's Finnish. Um, and I'm also pretty sure I don't know how to say it, so apologies. Uh, it was published November 14th, 2022, and the title is We're Getting a Better Idea of AI's True Carbon Footprint. Um, so this is uh, talking about a study from the um, team that worked on Bloom. Uh, I have uh, uh, an interview with Yasin on the channel from a while ago where we, we talked about some of these things. Uh, working on their idea of uh, helping them estimate, you know, how much carbon is it actually taking both to train and also to run this model. So training it, uh, quoting here, led to 25 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, but, and I think this is the crucial part that doesn't always get taken into account, the researchers found that figure doubled when they took into account the emissions produced by the manufacturing of the computer equipment used for training, the broader computing infrastructure, and crucially, the crucially there is me, uh, the energy required to actually run Bloom once it was trained. Uh, well, it may not seem like a lot for one model here, continuing to uh, to quote, 50 metric tons of carbon dioxide uh, emissions is the equivalent of around 60 flights between London and New York. It's significantly less than the emissions associated with other large language models of the same size. This is because Bloom was trained on a French supercomputer that is mostly powered by nuclear energy, which doesn't produce carbon dioxide emissions. Models trained in China, Australia, or some parts of the US, I would say most parts of the US, uh, which have inner grids that rely more on fossil fuels, fuels are more likely to be polluting. Uh, after it was launched, Hugging Face estimated that using the model emitted around 19 kilograms of carbon dioxide per day, which is similar to the emissions produced by driving around 54 miles in an average new car. Uh, hey, Dino. Uh, and a uh, comparison here, OpenAI's GPT-3 and Meta's OPT were estimated to emit more than 575 metric tons of carbon dioxide, respectively, just during training. Um, so I think the, the big takeaways here for folks who are working in the field and are interested in reducing their carbon footprint um, is, you know, A, the energy source that is used to power the training equipment matters, right? Um, and I would also say it's important to take into account, I mean, obviously for carbon dioxide, the energy source, but also um, things like water usage, uh, particularly if it's in a, a drought laden area where drought laden, drought burdened area, where you are also going to get exacerbated droughts due to climate change. Um, you know, just part of the, the things to think about. Uh, but also the models take a lot of carbon to run and the bigger the model is, the more, uh, you know, emissions it's going to cause. So one of the things that I always talk about on the channel is that um, my preference is always going to be for the smallest possible model <laughs> that can do what we're looking to do, right? Um, and part of that is just I am, you know, uh, a person without, you know, infinite funds to spend on, on training. Um, and part of it is that I am lazy and I don't want to wait around. Um, and part of it is also that, you know, bigger models, not only do they take longer to train, not only do they require more data, but they also uh, take more energy and uh, therefore carbon emissions to actually run. So important to think about when you are deciding whether or not you want to use a large language model. Uh, yeah, so I think really good work from uh, from these folks uh, and good to, to keep an eye on, um, particularly with these, these, you know, more and more uses of large language models. How can we as a field, you know, not only reduce our carbon footprints, but also save ourselves and our employers money because, you know, the carbon uh, is not free, right? Uh, the carbon emissions represent spending on electricity as well. All right, next up. Oh, so this was particularly interesting to me. So this is an Engadget, Engadget, E-N-G-A-D-G-E-T, uh, piece by uh, A. Tarantola, T-A-R-A-N-T-O-L-A. Uh, published September 29th, 2022, so it's a little bit older, uh, but it is a, um, uh, what's it called? It's a system that, uh, 
does lip reading. So lip reading is the task of watching usually silent video of someone's mouth and trying to figure out what they are saying. Um, and the uh, general uh, gist here is that the system is doing quite well when you compare it to untrained lip readers. Um, so there's, uh, they quote a study in here. This is quite a linguistic feat given that a 2009 study found that most people can only read lips with around 20% accuracy. Uh, and the CDC's Hearing Loss in Children Parents Guide estimates that a good speech reader may be able to see only four to five words in a 12 word sentence. Um, similarly, a 2011 study out of the University of Oklahoma saw only around 10% accuracy in its test subjects. Um, so they're talking about, you know, the general uh, difficulty of the task and also how people tend to be um, quite not very good at it. I would say that a lot of these stats tend to focus on untrained lip readers, um, focus who are people who do have training in it tend to do better. Uh, and also, generally, uh, you aren't communicating with somebody in a void, right? So uh, but first, I don't have many thoughts on the system. Mostly my thoughts are on the sort of kind of misrepresentation of uh, how good humans can be at this task. Because yes, if you are, you know, looking at somebody, A, you don't know, right? Familiarity with a speaker improves accuracy in general in all language tasks. Um, so for those of you who watch my channel a lot, you are probably much better at understanding me than people who don't. Uh, also, uh, context is important, right? So even in this communicative context, right, you have, if you are watching this visually, a uh, visual access to the thing that I am sharing. Uh, if you are just listening, you know the general topic and domain, you know we're talking about machine learning, you know we're talking about NLP. Um, so even if you only had access to my, you know, visuals of my, my mouth, um, you would probably uh, do better than someone who did not have access to any of that information. So um, my, my issue here is more that I think that this is a little bit of a, mm, I appreciate that they pulled in a bunch of research. I still think it's not an entirely fair comparison against the system uh, is the, the whole point there. Uh, anyway, I don't think it's necessarily a bad, uh, a bad application of the technology, right? Uh, particularly as potentially an assistive device. But I guess my question is, if this is an assistive device, um, presumably for someone who is deaf, uh, wouldn't that device also have access to the audio? So I suppose in terms of applications, this is also a little bit more focused on, um, potentially might be a little bit more focused on a surveillance application, which uh, you may know if you watch the channel a lot, not a huge fan of. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. Uh, next up, so this is a uh, Wall Street Journal piece by Christopher Mims, published November 12th, 2022. Uh, and the title is, Can You Tell Whether This Headline Was Written By A Robot? Not this time, but AI is churning out articles, illustration, fake product reviews, and even videos. Which I think folks you know, in the field are certainly aware of as a... Um, Thing that is happening. Uh, I know some of y'all work in SEO and uh, Godspeed. <laughs> uh, very rough to deal with this sort of generated content. Um, and the just a thick piece of the discussion of the challenges of it. Uh, and it's more um, uh, more focused on a general audience than a technical practitioner audience, but something to um, keep in mind is that this is becoming more generally known by, you know, society at large, right? Um, uh, so just some specific quotes from here. Uh, it's probably impossible that the majority of people who use the web on a day-to-day -day basis haven't at some point run into AI-generated content. I know that I have, uh, says Adam uh, Cronister, Cronister, C-H-R-O-N-I-S-T-E-R, who runs a small search engine optimization firm in Spokane, Washington. Uh, everyone in the professional search engine optimization groups of which he's part uses this technology to some extent, he adds. Uh, his customers include dozens of small and medium businesses, and for many of them, he uses AI software custom built to quickly generate articles that rank high in Google search results, a practice called content marketing. So it draws potential customers to the website, um, which I don't love, right? This 
as a person who lives in the world feels deceptive to me. Um, and it's something that as a consumer, I've noticed more and more when I'm looking for specific pieces of information, a lot of the information is generated automatically. And I can tell that it's generated automatically uh, because it's internally inconsistent, it's repetitive. Um, there's a lot of sort of like phrasing and rephrasing and it doesn't have, um, you know, internal narrative structure. Well, not necessarily narrative, but it doesn't have internal structure. Uh, and I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it as a consumer. Um, I don't like it that it's sort of becoming standard. And I imagine most folks also don't like that. Um, uh, another quote from the article, many of, most of our customers don't want it out being out there that the AI, that AI is writing their content, says Alex Cardinal, chief executive at Glimpse.ai, which created Article Forge, one of the services Mr. Conister uses. Before applying for a small business loan, it's impossible to research which type of loan you're eligible to receive, begins a 1,500-word article the company's AI wrote when asked to pen one about small business loans. The company has many competitors, including SEO.ai, TextCortex AI, and NeuroFlash. Uh, Google knows that the use of AI to generate content surfaced in search results is happening and is fine with it as long as the content produced by an AI is helpful to humans who read it, says a company spokeswoman. Grammar checkers and smart suggestions, Google itself, tool technologies Google itself offers in its tools are a piece of are of a piece with AI content generation, she adds, which I would disagree with. I would say that fully generated content is uh, human out of the loop, right? Uh, and that something like a grammar checker uh, or a smart suggestion is human in the loop and you are having, you know, um, direct human input into the, the, the output. So not a fan of it. Uh, I didn't realize it was like, I, I knew it as a consumer. I didn't realize, you know, how intentional it was that folks were doing this, but, um, yep, it's happening. All right. Next up, uh, we have a, uh, an ACM digital library article by Yuri, perhaps Y U R I Y. I'm not entirely sure what the value, vowel should be in there. Brun, B-R-U-N. Um, and it is entitled, The Promise and Perils of Using Machine Learning When Software Engineering, a keynote paper from uh, Multiskew, uh, proceeding of the sixth international workshop on machine learning techniques for software quality evaluation uh, from November, 2022. Um, and just to read the abstract, machine learning has radically changed what computing can accomplish, including the limits of what software engineering can do. I will discuss Discuss recent software engineering advances machine learning has enabled, from automatically repairing software bugs to data driven software systems that automatically learn to make decisions. Unfortunately, with the promises of these new technologies come serious perils. For example, automatically generated program patches can break as much functionality as they repair. And self learning data driven software can make decisions that result in unintended consequences, including unsafe, racist, or sexist behavior. But to build solutions to these shortcomings, we may need to look no further than machine learning itself. Um, I will identify multiple ways machine learning can help verify software properties leading to higher quality systems. So generally, the, the gist of the paper, um, which is uh, open source, Oh, thank you. It's given me some other recommended papers. The gist of the paper is that when you incorporate machine learning into software engineering, you get additional problems and those need to be addressed and using machine learning techniques to address them can be one of those. Um, so one of the um, one of the biggest issues that you know, particularly for generated code, I'm particularly worried about is introducing vulnerabilities. And in particular, people who, for example, know that GitHub is being scraped to, to train these systems and are intentionally doing data poisoning um, to have the ability to manipulate um, the, you know, the code that the system outputs to intentionally introduce software vulnerabilities, which uh, is not a thing that I think that we can actively necessarily um, mitigate against currently right it's a uh, it's a challenge so um, interesting piece i'll pop the link in the uh chat if you're interested in reading more all right uh 
there was also, uh, so this is from uh, Mastodon, uh, Maria, M-A-R-I-A, at data-folks.masto.host. Uh, data uh, and uh, Maria shared this little story. Uh, I can really appreciate how far removed academia is from industry sometimes. It's almost laughter, laughable. E.g., y'all's researching stuff like ethics and NLP, which is definitely something that uh, I research, <laughs> or research when I was actively doing research. Um, meanwhile, one time at work, we rolled out PII, private identifying information, personal identifying information, personal identifying information, uh, masking in our data warehouse, and in less than 12 hours, it had been turned off because it was, quote, too disruptive to existing workflows. Um, yep. And I think, I mean, I've uh, been thinking about this, right? Because this is a challenge. Um, I think a lot of the, the interest in ethics and NLP has really been about bias mitigation in, in systems, but something that I, you know, as someone who's been kind of outside of academia for a while now and more in industry, think about a lot is how do we, um, as practitioners, deal with situations like this, right? Because sometimes the thing that is better for society is worse for the company. Um, what do you do, right? How do you argue against this? Um, in this case, you know, we talked last week about uh, the Twitter engineer who was like, I'm not building, you know, super fine grained user identifying location data traces to sell to other folks. Um, but outside of, you know, a senior engineer who has a lot of institutional power putting down their foot or, um, you know, um, legislation, right? Uh, speaking of, of the DSA coming into, into effect today, um, yesterday, sorry, the 16th. Uh, yeah. What do you do in a situation like this, particularly when you don't have, as an IC, a lot of power, right? Maybe you're more junior, maybe you don't have a lot of sway on the team, um, or you have a lot of sway on your team, but the team that you are, you know, in contention with has even more sway, right? Um, and it's hard, right? It's a hard problem to build technology, particularly in a company when, um, you know, you may have a strong drive to protect users, but, you know, uh, the sales folks don't as much, right? They're they're not engineers. They don't have that, you know, well, whether or not we have a legal duty towards it, I think, you know, I certainly believe that we have a, a moral and ethical duty towards it. But, um, yeah, it's... It's a technology problem, sure, right? How do you build a less biased algorithm? How do you do, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? How do you do auditing of a system, but also how do you get other people in your organization on board? How do you make change uh, that protects users? Question mark. And I think legislation has to be part of that puzzle because that's what's going to um, help motivate companies, right? Like GDPR is what? It's 4% of global revenue for the, the worst types of infractions for, for tech companies. So that's a pretty big penalty. Um, yeah. But I think it's particularly, I know we talk about ethics research on the channel quite a bit, and I think it's good to have examples of what it looks like when people who are building systems run into situations like this. Anyway. Oh, right. So uh, the next piece here is from The Verge. One sec. Um, and it is by Tom Warren. Warren, probably W-A-R-R-E-N, uh, published November 9th, 2022. Um, and it is uh, a piece on a new feature that GitHub is experimenting with. GitHub is experimenting with a new way to let programmers create code with their voice inside Codepilot. Um, so I have uh, actually some friends who primarily program using their voice due to various um, you know, physical limitations that they have and disabilities. Um, so this is very much a, a thing that people try or need as a, an accessibility feature. Um, uh, the new experiment will be available at Co in Cobilot at ten a ten dollar per month AI tool that GitHub launched earlier this year to help developers write code. Uh, Copilot suggests lines of codes to developers inside their code editor and is capable of suggesting the next line of code as developers type in an integrated developer environment development environment like Visual Studio Code, NeoVim, and JetBrain IDEs. 
Uh, Copilot can even suggest complete methods and complex algorithms alongside boilerplate code to assist it with unit testing. Uh, I think it is worth pointing out at this point that there is an open lawsuit going on currently against Copilot, um, Microsoft, GitHub, and OpenAI. Uh, I think it's a class action lawsuit due to the use of code in a way that uh, the, the people filing the lawsuit argues verify, argues, they are arguing that it, not verify, what's the word I'm looking for? Violates um, the licenses that that code was released under. So on the one hand, uh, I think that this could be a great accessibility feature for folks that use this potentially, but on the other hand, um, I don't know how long Copilot is going to continue to exist in the way that it does, question mark. We talked last week about, or two weeks ago, two weeks ago about the stack. So that was the, the open science data set that only contains code that is permissibly uh, licensed. But GitHub Copilot is definitely trained on code that is not permissibly licensed as well. So uh, yeah, question mark. Um, I think it's I think it's interesting. I think it could be a very potentially helpful piece of technology, uh, but I think it also uh, is sort of an open question to what degree they are going to be able to continue to offer Copilot at all in the future. So, um, but if you're interested, it's uh, the product is called Hey GitHub, and you can uh, sign up for it, or maybe it's waitlisted. All right, next up, mm, shoot. Uh, so this is a piece from Wired, uh, and it's actually from July of this year, but I think it's particularly relevant again now, given that there have been another round of layoffs. Um, it's by Victoria, V-I-T-T-O-R-I-A, Elliot, um, and uh, it is titled, Tech Industry Layoffs May Undo Workforce Diversity Gains. Uh, companies have recently made progress in employee diversity, but cuts due to economic worries are expected to hurt underrepresented workers most. Um, and this is uh, due to a number of factors, but a big one is that when there are, um, you know, Workforce cuts, generally more senior workers, so workers who have been at a specific company longer, tend to um, are less likely to be cut. Workers that have been hired more recently are more likely to be cut. Um, and since the first round of hiring at most companies is done through individuals' social networks, right? So, and I don't mean like posting on Twitter necessarily, but like hiring people you know uh, and in particular, white folks tend to have very homogenous social networks, so mostly other white folks. Um, let's see, I think they have a citation for that in here. Uh, homogenous? Nope. Uh, social. Da, da, da. Let's see. Uh, I've thought for sure that they had a citation in here. Mm. Well, I'm not finding it uh, on a quick, uh, a quick scroll. Oh, here we go. Um, in the early ghost stages, most companies hire by f referral, says Fox Melton. We know that 75% of white people have all white networks, meaning that companies are more likely to be hiring more and more white people early on. So because you have this sort of social network uh, homogeneity with the people who are more likely to get venture capital funding to create these companies in the first place, you're going to have sort of, um, you know, more senior employees are more likely to be white. Um, and then also there's uh, an effect where people from underrepresented backgrounds tend to be pushed into less prestigious job titles. Um, so uh, discussion they have here, um, certain departments and tech companies outside engineering, such as business development, customer success, communications, and marketing also tend to be more heavily stacked with women and historically underrepresented minority groups. Um, Da, da, da. Uh, individuals in these roles are still more likely to face layoffs because they are seen as less essential to the business than those who develop or maintain the product. Um, and this is something that I, you know, I personally have uh, have had experience with in the past, where I have been pushed uh, to apply to roles that are that are less technical, even though you know my background 
it perfectly enables me to apply for very technical roles. So I don't know, something to keep an eye on. Um, and this is uh, rendering weirdly, but the next article here, we're gonna talk about Twitter for a little bit. It's in the air is from Reuters, 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 uh, and it's by Avi Asher Shapiro, uh, and it was published November 11th, 2022, uh, and the title is Feature How Musk's Twitter Takeover Could Endanger Vulnerable Users. Uh, so for those of you who are not aware, um, Twitter recently changed ownership, and there have been a lot of changes at the company since then. Um, so. Uh, well over half the company, I believe, has been fired, including most of the content moderation teams, um, you know, the entire fairness and um, ethics team <laughs> got fired, uh, and they had a pretty good ethics team as well. Um, yeah, so worrying, uh, and the uh, the big worry of a lot of folks is that this is going to really uh, affect not just uh let's say the the companies that have been affected who are you know being impersonated on twitter or that recently happened and it, it hurt quite a number of companies uh, but also particularly vulnerable folks around the world so uh, quoting here from the article, uh, Musk's mass layoffs at Twitter are putting government critics and opposition figures around the world at risk, digital rights activists and groups warn, as the company slashes staff, including human rights experts and workers in regional hubs. Um, not great, <laughs> uh, right? Um, a loss of more experienced workers may mean Twitter falls in line with more requests from officials worldwide to curb critical speech and hand over data on users. And this has been a continuing pressure on Twitter, uh, particularly from authoritarian governments around the world. Um, Twitter fired about half of its 7,500 staff last week following a $44 billion buyout by Musk. Um, and I believe they have fired even more staff since then. Um, issue, <laughs> right? Uh, the uh, also other things they talk about, uh, the Twitter head of safety has left uh, right experts. Rights experts have raised concerns over the loss of specialist rights and ethics teams and media reports of heavy cuts in regional headquarters, including Asia and Africa. There are also fears in rise of misinformation and harassment with the loss of staff uh, with the knowledge of local contexts and languages outside the United States. Um, yeah, <laughs> the risk is especially acute for users based in the global majority, people of color and those in the global south and in conflict zones, says Marlena Wisniak, a lawyer who worked at Twitter on human rights and government issues until August. So yes, that is the, uh, the big issue. Um, there are worries about censorship. There's worries about surveillance. There's worries about election violence, um, not just in the US, right? We talked on the channel recently about issues um, with violence around Kenya's election on Facebook, um, but obviously, you know, Twitter, another another platform um, that is uh, kind of not really doing a lot of moderation right now. Uh, also on the, the moderation front, so this piece is from Rest of the World, uh, one of our favorite uh, news sources here on the channel, uh, published November 16th, and it does not have the, uh, the name of the uh, person who wrote it, but it is an interview with Melissa Engel, uh, a former senior data scientist at Twitter who was fired, um, and she talks about some of uh, her work that's just not being done anymore, right? So I was a senior data scientist working in civic integrity and political misinformation. I wrote and monitored the algorithms which scan Twitter for political misinformation. We continuously trained and updated our models. We also sent a subsection of tweets we flagged for human reviews. Um, so there were 30 people uh, total on the team and I think m most of them are gone uh, is my general impression. Um, so uh, some issues that, you know, even before the moderation staff were cut were, you know, big were that not everywhere got the same amount of attention, right? Um, I think, so this is again from, from Melissa, I think we missed many countries in Africa and we were also hampered by working in parts of Southeast Asia due to local government infrastructure. Um, yes. 
obviously a lot of work was being done by this team. Um, and there are some points that she made that I think were particularly important, again, for the professional LLP context. Um, so uh, a lot of the moderation was done algorithmically, some of it by hand. Um, so this is different from like we talked about TikTok last week, where most of their moderation is done by hand and some of it's done algorithmically. Uh, machine learning needs constant updating and changes as the nature of political discourse changes. We have not yet seen the negative impact of these policies, right? So um, as new political movements or, you know, discussions occur, uh, moderation about misinformation needs to be updated to address those. So uh, issue. Uh, and uh, the, the final question, what are you most fearful about in light of the current cuts to the moderation team? Can platform integrity be maintained with automated moderation alone? Um, and Mulsa, who, remember, works professionally in automated moderation, says no. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying we can't get there. Maybe we can. But right now, we need both machine learning and human review. Uh, and as stated above, as misinformation and harassment gets worse and worse as time will get worse and worse on, as time goes on, unless something is done about it. So, so yes, very worrying, particularly for those of us who use Twitter. And with that, we're done with the professional stuff uh, and time to talk about politics. And we're going to start with Twitter again. Um, so, so far we've been talking about, you know, issues that are affecting users, um, but uh, it's also going to affect the company. Uh, so uh, this first piece is from the Financial Times. It is by uh, Javier Espinoza in Brussels. Uh, and the title is, oh, when was it published? Give me the date. Oh, yesterday. Sorry, it's not written as a date. Yesterday. So this is the 17th. That was on the 16th. Uh, and the title is Elon Musk's Twitter on, quote, collision course with EU regulators. Social media platform faces fresh scrutiny under new landmark laws to police big tech. And I believe that this is specifically about the Digital Services Act. Yes. Um, so the rules for um, online platforms and very large online platforms, and they determine whether a platform is very large by whether or not 10% of EU citizens use it. And if you are a very large platform, you have a lot of additional a lot. You have additional responsibilities and duties under this law. Um, the EU on Wednesday kickstarted its designation of which platforms meet the threshold of at least 45 million users and will have to adhere to the most stringent rules. This process will last four months. Twitter is expected to be within this category. Um, and uh issue <laughs> the dsa will require twitter as a very large online platform to have massive technical and legal compliance said a person with knowledge of the situation many of these people have left or were laid off it seems they are on a collision course with brussels uh yeah um christelle shalden mose uh an MEP who will chair the group on the implementation of the DSA said Twitter could very well be the case to test the DSA for the first time. So not great news for Twitter on the EU front, um, unless of course they immediately began to work on compliance and also they should have already been doing it probably. And I imagine that a lot of the folks that were laid off were working on that. Uh, also, not great news for Twitter on the US front. Uh, so this is a piece from The Verge by Alex Heath, uh, updated November 10th. Elon Musk is putting Twitter at risk of billions in fines, warns company lawyer. Um, so uh, in the US, Twitter is under a compliance decree, which means basically the, the FTC, which is US government uh, body, says that they have to do certain things or they will be fined a lot of money. Um, and it is very possible that they are just not going to be able to do those things. Um, some uh, selected quotes from here. A company lawyer is encouraging employees to seek whistleblower protection if you feel uncomfortable about anything you are being asked to do. Um, the company's chief privacy officer, chief information security officer, and chief compliance officer have all resigned. Uh, those, by the way, are the people who would probably be in charge of being in uh, compliance with the DSA, so th that's not great. Um, yeah, the FTC reached a settlement with Twitter in May after the company was caught using personal info to target ads. If Twitter doesn't comply with the agreement, the FTC can issue fines reaching into billions of dollars, according to the lawyer's note to employees. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, Musk's new legal department is now asking engineers to, quote, self-certify compliance with FTC rules and other privacy laws, according to a lawyer's note and another employee familiar with the matter who requested anonymity to speak without the company's permission. Um, I also say, you know, more on the professional side, that um, if you are the individual engineer who said, yes, we are doing the specific thing that the FTC tells us we have to do, um, it sounds like... Again, hard to say what's going on with them, but Twitter may be putting the responsibility onto individual engineers to try and offload it from the company as much as possible. Ah. <laughs> um, anyway, not great. Not great news for the company. Not great news for the lawyer. For the lawyers, well, I mean, uh, not great news for users. Uh, I imagine also the lawyers who are involved are uh, not delighted at having to be involved, uh, which is probably why most of them quit, uh, it appears, based on, on reports I've read. So that's that. Um, and also, so we talked about the DSA, we talked about this FTC compliance thing. Um, also, Twitter is currently out of compliance with GDPR, which has been around for a bit. Um, and so this is a piece from TechCrunch by Natasha Lomas, Lomas, L-O-M-A-S, um, published November 14th. Uh, and it appears that, um, you know, Twitter had been, to read from the article, uh, like many major tech firms with customers across the EU, Twitter currently avails itself to a mechanism in GDPR known as the One Shop Stop. This is beneficial because it allows the company to streamline regulatory administration by being able to exchange exclusivity with a lead data supervisor in the EU member state where it is main established, in Twitter's case, Ireland. Uh, and I believe Ireland is a little bit more lenient than some other states. Um, however, uh, I don't know that they're going to be able to keep doing that based on this article. Uh, and also, I don't think they have a data protection officer. Under the EU's GDPR, Twitter is obligated in just one very basic requirement to have a data protection officer to provide a contact point for regulators. Uh, the departure of Kieran, Kieran? Kieran, K-I-E-R-A-N, the first and only DPO since the role was created at the company in 2019, 2018, has not gone unnoticed and by its data protection watchdog in Ireland, as we also reported Friday. Um, that's not just it, but it seems like they're out of compliance with GDPR and it's getting worse and worse and worse. So, yep. <laughs> That's happening. Anyway, that's all the Twitter stuff. Uh, basically, the um, you know beyond the you know individual users being negatively impacted, the fact that Twitter is no longer in compliance. It seems like perhaps or may or may not be in the future, given the DSA with a lot of laws and consent decrees, is not great for the company. And also potentially engineers who are working there may bear some of the brunt of responsibility for that question mark. I don't know. Um, anyway, if I were working at Twitter, I would uh, be finding a lawyer if I didn't have one already or quitting one of the two. All right. So this next piece, again, um, on on politics uh, is from Coda, Coda Story, uh, and it's by Erica Hellerstein, uh, November 10th, 2022. Uh, and the piece is titled, As Anxiety About Crime Peaks, U.S. Cities Look to Surveillance Techs, But Does It Actually Work? Um, so it's a really nice overview, I'm gonna pop this in the chat as well, of some of the U.S. cities and states that are using surveillance technology um, and, I mean, paying handsomely for it, uh, but also a good, um, you know, a thing that they talk about here that I think is really important to talk about and kind of hasn't been um, is that uh, there's not really a lot of evidence that uh, surveillance tools actually do anything to reduce or solve crime, right? Um, Shot Spotter, which we've talked about on the channel before, right? Shot Spotter says it has a 97% accuracy rate, but a 2021 analysis of the Chicago Depart Police Department's use of Shot Spotter by the city's Office of Inspector General found that just 9% of the alerts were related to gun related crimes. So, um, uh, wildly different numbers there from the company itself and an independent audit of the tool in practice. Um, also, there's a currently a class action lawsuit uh, that alleges that the city has intentionally deployed shot spotter along stark racial lines and uses shot spotter to target black and Latinx people. Uh, 
Yes. Um, so a lot of the discussion in here is that a lot of cities are using this. A lot of cities are paying a lot for it, right? Um, so uh, Albert Fox Chan, Can, C A H N, uh, the founder and executive director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project in New York, is one of surveillance opportunism, in which technology companies are pitching surveillance systems to lawmakers and law enforcement agencies to seeking to quell concerns about public safety. Um, but it doesn't. Right, there's no good evidence, uh, empirical evidence that I have seen that these surveillance systems actually work, right? It's something that, you know, uh, legislators and regulators can, well, legislators can look at and be like, hey, look, we, we spend a bunch of money on this policing technology. Whether or not it works uh, is not really the thing that they are most focused on. So a good thing to think about when uh, surveillance technology is sort of discussed as a, quote, solution to crime is, um, is there any empirical evidence that it actually works? And like I said, I am not familiar with any. And I imagine if there were any, the companies that are selling this would um, be making it very uh, much part of the public discussion. So something to think about. All right, moving out of the US context. Um, so this part I thought was particularly interesting. Um, this piece I thought was particularly interesting. It's from Rest of the World uh, by Varsha Bansal, Bansal, B-A-N-S-A-L, published November 14th. Um, and it is, gig workers in India are uniting to take back control from algorithms. Tired of the obscurity around black box algorithms that dictate their lives, India's gig workers are coming up with cheap hacks to game the system. Uh, and there's a specific uh, term for this, which I'm, I know my vowels are not going to be right. Uh, Jugad, J-U-G-A-A-D, um, that are, you know, community sourced um, ways of interacting with the system to help get around or, you know, make their working lives more tolerable. Uh, so there are a bunch of examples, right? So um, here is uh, someone who had a $61 fee uh, levied by Uber uh, and the, uh, you know, uh, folks in a Telegram group explained that it was a mandatory tax payment and offered a cheap hack to offset the hefty one-time charge, keep accepting rides, and Uber will auto-deduct the amount from the daily earnings rather than paying the big amount up front. Um, I should say this is something that I believe would not be legal in the U.S., potentially. I guess it would depend on the state you were in, um, to require that you pay to start working. Um, yeah, uh, he managed to clear more than 2,000 rupees out of 5,000 of the tax liability in under a month. Uh, these are examples of how India's gig workers, tired of the obscurity around black box, black box algorithms and technologies that dictate their work and lives, are finding ways to game the platforms to their advantage. Um, and uh, a lot of discussion of these sort of groups that are, that are coming up around the use of these gig work platforms to try and help each other have, um, you know, a better, a better working experience as much as possible. So, uh, yeah. And the reason that I, I put this into, into politics is because I think that this is a good, um, you know, a good example of a need that workers have, right. That they want to know information about how they are being about their work. Um, they want transparency about wages and why they're paid and how they can, you know, get, the work that they want to do um and uh help avoid the um manipulation of platforms that is not in the worker's best interest right uh so this particular example uh uber nudges drivers to go to a location where there's higher demand and a lower supply of cabs the app does so by showing surge pricing on a heat map but multiple drivers told rest of the world that over the years they have realized it's just a ruse by the app to bring them to a location with a low supply without actually giving them the benefits of a higher fare uh the map glow glow up turn red in color and show the multiplied fares we can get if we go to that specific area but as soon as as we go, the surge pricing is gone. Uh, he says he has stopped falling for this trap by the algorithm, right? So again, I would say that's sort of a deceptive labor practice on Uber's part, um, where they are not actually, you know, fairly representing to workers uh, the earnings that they could get. Uh, yeah, anyway, interesting piece. Um, 
and um, I have very little knowledge about India's legislative process. I imagine some of you have more, uh, so potentially something that might be addressed uh, via other means. But in the meanwhile, um, workers are, you know, showing solidarity with each other to try and make their work as um, beneficial to them as possible, which I approve of. All right. Uh, next up, so this is from uh, Data and Society, which is a nonprofit slash think tank here in the US. Uh, and this piece is uh, a response to the FTC's advance notice of proposed rulemaking on commercial surveillance and data security. Uh, and it is by a number of folks, uh, including Serena Oduro, uh, Sarita Amrut, Amrute. Oh, A-M-R-U-T-E, Jenna Burrell, B-U-R-R-E-L-L, -L, uh, Robin Kaplan, Amanda Lenhart, Alexandra Matiscu, uh, Jacob Metcalf, and Meg Young. Apologies to anyone whose name I mispronounced, um, but it is their their response to uh, the fact that the FTC. So they don't actually have any new rules yet, but they are considering it. Uh, and so this is a bunch of researchers working in the area, um, researchers and I would say activists working in the area, uh, providing feedback. Uh, and they're uh, really, you know, overall happy that it's going to happen, right? Uh, we are pleased that they're seriously considering new rules aimed at addressing concerns about harmful commercial surveillance and inadequate data security. Uh, it's an important moment to rein in the power of big tech and advance the public interest and a historic opportunity to help shape the future of how algorithmic decision-making systems are governed in, in the United States. Um, so similar to the decision-making systems used for, you know, uh, Uber drivers in India. Um, and uh, some of their specific recommendations are, one, pursue rulemaking to combat the many varied and specific ways that commercial surveillance and data security harms consumers, um, so consumer protection. Uh, mandate that researchers have access to commercial surveillance platforms data in order to better understand and characterize their harms. Uh, makes sense, data and society does research. Uh, target specific means by which commercial surveillance and data security harms protected classes. Uh, so this is a legal term in the US, includes, you know, um, people who, uh, it includes groups of people uh, who are especially vulnerable. Uh, create accountability mechanisms especially vulnerable or historically um, uh, depressed, really. Come on, brain, give me the word. Orchestrated, no, none of those. Denigrated, no. Discriminated, historically discriminated against. Uh, create accountability mechanisms that include affirmative obligations for transparent assessment practices, paths to, paths to redress and justice for consumers. So like, hey, you have to do this thing to show that your system does what it says you'll do. And if it doesn't, this is what you got to do. And here's how you're going to make it right to the people you've harmed, the consumers. Uh, safeguard children and teens from the harms associated with commercial data surveillance while being mindful of the unique complexities of youth, young people's needs, and their place in the broader family system. And protect workers who are particularly vulnerable to commercial surveillance and pay attention to the myriad ways that surveillance is used to control them. Uh, so these are the recommendations of specific rules that Data and Society would like to see the FTC uh, make to address uh, some ongoing harms. So yeah, interesting to see uh, where this goes, if you would like to submit a comment, comment is open until November 21st, I believe. I don't know that you have to be from the US to do it, but they're probably gonna listen more if you are, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, and also, so this is a little bit more on the, the law side, this is from The Verge. Uh, it's by James Vincent. Uh, November 15th, 2022. The scary truth about AI copyright is no one knows what will happen next. The last year has seen a boom in AI models to create art, music, and code by learning from others' work. But as the tools become more prominent, unanswered legal questions should shape the future of, could shape the future of the field. And I'm, I'm guessing they will. Right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Some things we've talked about on the channel, we talked about the GitHub, uh, uh, ongoing uh, court case. Um, 
We've talked about, you know, the fact that record companies are sort of like hinting that they might get into the arena, particularly with music generation trained on, um, you know, music that they, they have the rights to or they control the rights to. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I thought this opening paragraph was particularly uh, good, succinct. Uh, generative AI has had a very good year. Corporations like Microsoft, Adobe, and GitHub are integrating the tech into their products. Startups are raising hundreds of millions to compete with them. So stability, uh, stable AI, for example, had a very good fundraising round. And the software even has cultural clout with text to image AI models founding countless memes. But listen in on any industry discussion around generative AI, and you'll hear in the background a question whispered by advocates and critics alike in increasingly concerned tones, is any of this actually legal? Um, which question mark, right? We don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot of discussion of like specific artists whose work is being, uh, whose work style is being copied. Um, and they talked to a bunch of people. Uh, some, some said with confidence that these systems were certainly capable of infringing copyright and could face legal, serious legal challenges in the near future. Others suggested equally confident that the opposite was true, that everything currently happening in the field of generative AI is legally above board and any lawsuits are doomed to fail. Um, and given the fact that there is memorization in, again, on the text models, pretty much every text model that I'm familiar with, um, I haven't seen good evidence that um, you can avoid it with particularly a large language model. I am definitely in this first group, right? Like, I think that there is, um, I think copyright infringement uh, is definitely potentially a thing. The folks filing the GitHub lawsuit also say that. So we'll see. Uh, the reality is, the reality is, nobody knows. Uh, Bao, who's been following the generative AI scene closely, told The Verge, and anyone who says they know confidently how this will play out in court is wrong. Yeah, oh, I have no idea how it's going to play out. I just have a strong feeling. So, we'll find out. All right, and with that, research. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm been very... Um, my throat's been a little bit irritated today, so apologies if it's affecting my vocal quality. So this first thing is actually kind of like news about research. Um, so this was announced this week. I, I looks like their um, news site has been around for a bit, but they just sort of had a big like splash this week. Um, so it's the Coalition for Independent Technology Research, uh, Independent Tech Research. Uh, our mission is to advance, defend, and sustain the right to ethically study the impact of technology on society. Uh, and they are currently seeking funding. Uh, and they have uh, quite a few organizations uh, associated with it. Uh, so organizations include um, ACLU, the Algorithmic Transparency Institute, the Brown Institute for Media Innovation, Columbia University School of Journalism, the Center for Democracy and Technology, we talked about them today, Citizens and Technology Lab at Cornell, Consumer Reports, Digital Interest Lab, Inside Airbnb, I've never heard of them, but I don't really look at Airbnb, um, NYU Cybersecurity for Democracy, Stanford Internet Observatory, Tech Policy Press, and the University of Texas at Austin Center for Media Engagement uh, and Media and Democracy Data Cooperative. Um, and then there's also a lot of individual um, members as well. And I'm just sort of scanning these names to see if it's anyone. Uh, so Meredith Broussard, uh, I know. Uh, Ruman Chowdhury, I know she was fired from Twitter quite recently. Um, yeah, so lots of folks interested in it. Um, yeah, and interesting to see how they will go, how this will go, right? So their activities, things that they're interested in uh, doing as a collective, I guess, what they call themselves? Coalition? 
uh, will engage in crisis response, advocacy, and communications while also strengthening and supporting the ecosystem of independent researchers. We expect our initial activities to include organizing mutual defense uh, for people who, for com against companies who attack and obstruct independent researchers, uh, making the case for independent research. We will advocate uh, to ensure that the public, policymakers, and corporate actors understand how ethical and independent research serves the common good, create standards and oversight, conduct advocacy, uh, convene communities of practice and uh, grow funding and sustainability of independent research. Um, so this is sort of what they would like to do. Uh, and then they have a bunch of founding members as well. Uh, yeah, and I'm interested to see how this goes. Uh, and there was also a, a Mastodon Toot. <laughs> They're called Toot. Uh, a discussion of this by Rachel Coldicott on Mastodon. Uh, R-A-C-H-E-L-C-O-L-D-I-C-U-T-T -T at assembleag.es. Uh, a Mastodon instance for people interested in thinking creatively and critical about critically about technology in the broadest sense. Uh, and just to read some of her her thoughts, uh, super interested in the Coalition for Independent Tech Research, so I'm going to think out loud about power dynamics and influence in research for a moment. Uh, first, I'm totally aligned on overall aims. It's great to see thoughtful organizing around this because I agree that big tech money distorts research and this doesn't get enough pushback. Um, in an LP and ex in particular, I think, you know, We've seen a lot of focus on transformers to the, I wouldn't say exclusion, but certainly detriment of other approaches. Uh, brilliant to see that addressed head on and congrats to everyone involved. Uh, I've been running a tiny applied independent research org for the last two years. There are seven of us in the UK. We bring practitioner-led experience to policy research and creating pilots. We're neither academics nor think tank, and we're trying to lay down some planks for building a better internet. Losing the networks and influence of Twitter is a very big detail because, let me tell you, money does not from the fall from the sky in this work. Social justice funders are not that engaged. Uh, now, I'm not calling the way ambulance here. We have worked out a way of making it work. Mostly we use money we make from client projects to support other activity, and we are super lucky to have developed some long-term partnerships to develop long-term change. But like I say, it's not easy, and we don't have institutional fundraisers and the clout of massive academic organizations behind us. We're in indie, I guess. We're by no means the rival to big ticket US organizations, not least because we do different kinds of work, but it's an ecosystem and we're complementary. I'm guessing this new individual initiative is powered by individual researchers taking a stand, which I absolutely applaud and support them. So I guess what I'm asking, not just on our behalf, but all that indies that bootstrap their own work, is that we grow the space beyond big tech thoughtfully and together. There is not much money. Funding is hard, and big names are attractive to funders who are tentatively entering new areas. It would be brilliant to see the space grow in a world is grow in a way that is not just asserting, asserting that research funding should be nonpartisan and more diverse, but also more cultivating more plurality and different kinds of organization. I'm sure the intent to do there is to do so is there, but times are tough. So I wanted to say the quiet part out loud, nice and early. Uh, Tom says, memorization does not equal copyright infringement if the work is transformative. Yes, I guess that's the question, right? Is the generative work transformative? Question mark. <laughs> um, and particularly, you know, when it comes to code, if I am using uh, a large chunk of code that is directly memorized from another, um, you know, uh, directly memorized from another repository that is not licensed by the license of that repository. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the thing I could be doing, right? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think a, a good point to to think about here, um, right, is where is the money going to come from? Um, research is expensive, right? You need to pay researchers to do the research uh, and not other things with their time. And I think it is definitely, I'd love to see more independent research being funded. I'd love for this to be a career for more people, uh, but it is definitely challenging to find the funding for it, particularly at a time when, you know, tech money is kind of drying up, right? Tech companies aren't doing so well. Um, yeah. 
So definitely worth thinking about. Um, I'm interested to see how this goes, what their funding, you know, looks like going forward. Um, and, and how they do. I mean, I, I wish them best of luck. I would love to see more independent research being done, um, but I guess we'll see. All right, next up. All right. Uh, so this is a preprint uh, by Borheen Lili uh, Heimlin, perhaps, and Leif Hancock Slee. Uh, so that's B O R H A N E B L I L I dash H A M E L I N and L E I F H A N C O X dash L I. Uh, so this is, as far as I know, this is a preprint. It's under review. Okay, helpful. Uh, and uh, I think it brings up some points that I've, you know, kind of been thinking about, but I haven't articulated super well. Uh, so the title of the paper is Making Intelligence, Ethics, IQ, and Machine Learning Benchmarks. Uh, in the abstract, the machine learning community recognizes the importance of anticipating and mitigating the potential negative impacts of benchmark research. Um, I definitely think it's something that people think about. In this position paper, we argue that more attention must be paid to areas of ethical risk at the technical and scientific core of machine learning benchmarks. We identify overlooked structural similarities between human IQ and machine learning benchmarks. Uh, they share similarities in, similar in setting standards for describing, evaluating, and comparing performance on tasks relevant to intelligence. Drawing on prior research on IQ benchmarks from a feminist philosophy of science, we argue that values need to be considering need to be considered when creating machine learning benchmarks and data sets, and that it is, and this is the important part here, not possible to avoid this chess choice by creating benchmarks that are value neutral. Finally, we outline practical recommendations for benchmark research ethics and ethics review, right? So the, the point that I'm making here is that um, like measuring IQ, uh, measuring machine learning systems um, requires making <laughs> Barking <laughs> requires making decisions about what it is that uh, you are going to consider the most uh, important thing to measure. Uh, yes. So I don't necessarily want to read uh, the whole paper end to end because it is uh, quite long, as you I don't think you can see off the side, uh, but it's quite long. I'm just doing a little uh, scroll through. So it's uh, 10 pages. Uh, but I think that uh, what would be, thank you, uh, a good thing to do is check out some of the pr practical recommendations for folks. So in case you are, you know, if you're choosing to work on a benchmark, it's something that you're thinking about. And if you're developing a benchmark, it's something you can think about. So being reflective, explicit, and public about the social, political, and ethical values behind machine learning research is vital to the pursuit of responsible machine learning. It is also paramount for any attempt at developing adequate ethical guidelines and ethics review for a premier research venue like NeurIPS. Uh, NeurIPS has added ethical review recently, I believe. We've argued that in at least three ways, scientific and technical decisions about machine learning benchmarks are at least implicitly dependent on ethical values. From the perspective of identifying and mitigating the ethical risks of machine learning benchmark research, the areas of task selection, choice of validity standards, and path dependence each need close and thorough scrutiny. Uh, so task selection, what are you doing? Choice of validity standards, what are you measuring? Uh, and path dependence, no idea. What is path dependence? Uh, uh, da, da, da. Oh, gotcha. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy sort of thing. Uh, self-fulfilling dynamics can occur in AI evaluation. Uh, intelligent tests for humans can be used to place certain humans in lower resource environments that then cause them to do per poorly on further intelligence tests. Similarly, machine learning benchmarks can discourage work on certain types of models, which in turn causes these types of models to do poorly according to similar benchmarks in the future. So I'd say an example of that is, uh, you know, the big focus on glue benchmarks and general purpose models, right? Which if you're building a model for a specific purpose, obviously your model is not going to do well on. So it prioritizes uh, and brings more light to large general purpose models, which as I mentioned many times are not my favorite type of model. I think they are less useful and more expensive. Uh, okay. So that's what path dependence is that 
starting to do these things encourages these things to continue happening and makes other things look worse, even though for a particular application they may not be. The first recommendation is for people working on ethics guidelines and ethics reviews for machine learning benchmarks and community like NeurIPS datasets and benchmarks track. Given the unique role of ML benchmarks in enabling the evaluation and comparison of machine learning models, examination of the ethical risks of benchmarks should not be narrowly limited to considerations about their potential uses or about the treatment of human subjects. Uh, here, we've identified sources of ethical risks that come with seemingly technical aspects of benchmarks. Are other key decision points about the technical features of benchmarks that also pose significant ethical risks? What actionable guidelines might enable researchers and reviewers to more reflectively and explicitly consider these ethical risks? We hope that these three areas we've identified are helpful as a starting point in answering these questions. So an example I can think of here is if you are looking at, um, you know, overall accuracy is your target benchmark um, and you have some rare subgroups in your data, um, if you do poorly on those rare subgroups but much better on the majority group, then you're going to have a system that performs pretty well. But it could be that the rare subgroups are the ones who would benefit the most from access to this type of model and therefore, you know, their performance should be upweighted and choosing not to do that means that you are prioritizing building the types of models that um, aren't as helpful for, for folks in those groups, right? Uh, a second recommendation is aimed at researchers. My screen went black for a sec. Uh, given the unique role of benchmarks in machine learning research, researchers should avoid interpreting performance on benchmarks as a value neutral indicator of capability. And uh, reviewers too. Moreover, we recommend that researchers developing benchmarks explicitly and reflectively discuss the potential ethical risks that comes with areas like task selection, standards of validity, and path dependence, either through part of benchmark documentation or as part of impact statements or as part of papers themselves. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that's really valuable because in my experience, um, you know, when someone makes a technical decision that ends up negatively hurting people, generally it's not uh, intentional, it's because that they didn't think about it and having uh, a reflective uh, thinking about it stage built into the research process, I think could be very helpful. Uh, this will in turn help other practitioners choose which benchmarks to use when evaluating their models. For example, if a particular form of external validity, e.g. consequential validity, uh, is particularly important to a real-world application, data scientists who are evaluating models can more easily choose benchmarks that emphasize consequential validity while putting less weight on benchmarks that don't. This will better align model evaluation with the values that a practitioner wants. Uh, Tom says, the assumption behind IQ is that there is a single unlearned intelligence factor, G, uh, i.e. that IQ is value-free. Yes, but test, test something, right? <laughs> um, Yes, I think that that is the the general idea. Um, I don't think that, uh, again, from a, a social sciences background, which is my background, um, the tests actually do a very good job of looking at that, right? So just as an example, most IQ tests uh, tend to include at least some language component. Um, and you know what language it's delivered in, and the language of the um, you know uh, the languages that particularly children have been exposed to are going to affect how well they do on the test, but are not necessarily a reflection of their underlying ability. Uh, yeah, Tom says that may be true. Uh, it's where psychometrics is at. They haven't found evidence for multiple intelligences. Uh, so I'm assuming that's things like spatial intelligence, you know, linguistic intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, again, as a, as a social scientist, I don't think IQ is that useful. Uh, <laughs> uh, period. Um, yep, I mean, it can be, It can be helpful in terms of understanding the value systems of people who think that IQ is very important. Um, so it can be useful in that way, but uh, not something that, that I would use personally in my own work. Um, also, I guess my general question is, I mean, if you're studying intelligence as a specific object of study, then I understand why having an authorizationalization for it would be valuable. But on the other hand, um, again, I'm 
like I said, my training is mainly in so, uh, social sciences and not so much psychometrics. Um, my sort of concern is often that intelligence is used as a way to rank people in relation to each other uh, and say that some people are better than others, um, which particularly given the history of social science uh, is worrying to me. Uh, the history of social science, a very important part of the history of the field, is that it was explicitly used as a tool of colonialism and uh, racial oppression and violence to prove <laughs> that uh, the people doing the oppression and violence were better than the people that they were oppressing and doing violence to, and therefore it was fine, um, which uh, is antithetical to my deepest held personal beliefs and values. So, uh, yes, I tend to, uh, be very suspicious of research that uses IQ as a factor. Um, which again, I understand if you are studying like intelligence is the object of study, that's one thing, but particularly once you start adding the social component, um, I begin to get suspicious. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, it's just like that's in terms of sociolinguistic variation, not not of interest, right? Like not a relevant variable. Um, so not something we we look at. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, again talking about uh, uh, what you are measuring and how you are measuring it and how that encodes your values, right? Um, uh, and what you care about and what you want to do and what you're going to do is important to think about. Anyway, and I'll, uh, you know, well, actually, let's read the section because I think it's relevant to the uh, to the discussion we're having here. So this is from section uh, 3.1, values determine what counts as intelligence. Uh, values enter in defining Values enter in defining the boundaries of the object of intelligence research. I'm having a very hard time parsing this sentence, um, but boundaries are important. Values are important because they help determine what counts as intelligence research. Intelligence research is concerned with abilities, but what are their boundaries? Where, where do abilities begin and end? What marks an ability as relevant or irrelevant to intelligence? Whose ability is intelligence research about? Consider questions about the relationship between objects of intelligence research and cultural boundaries. Are the findings of intelligence research culturally specific? Uh, Warren and Burningham argue this concern is heightened by the fact that definitions of intelligence are not only variable across cultures, even within specific culture, there is a lack of expert consensus, not only on what generally falls under the term intelligence, but also on the specific abilities that matter to intelligence. Um, uh, Tom says, the aim behind IQ tests is to sort of dodge what people have learned. Uh, yeah, but we're embodied, right? Like, <laughs> there, there is no human without learning, right? It's, um, even just perceptual learning, right? Even just being able to look at a mark and interpret that it is a mark, even just being able to look at your hand and be like, this part is not my hand, this part is my hand, right? Like you can't, to be human and to be alive is to be a creature that has learned uh, and continues to learn. And like, I get it, but Anyway, continuing to read. Uh, following Anderson, we consider boundary problems to come hand in hand with the fact that intelligence is a thick evaluative concept. Uh, footnote three, yes, what, what is a thick evaluative concept? Uh, okay, it's just a citation. <laughs> I, th I thought it would be more discussion. So it's a thick evaluative concept, no idea what that is. Uh, there are cross-cultural variations and there is a lack of expert consensus on what falls under intelligence because ethical values and interests play a central role in determining the what in determining what phenomena fall under the concept and the theoretical content of the concept. The problem is shared with research on topics like health and well-being. Social science disciplines that inherit their subject matter from thick concepts usually face problems with separating the selection of the boundaries of their topic from ethical values. 
As Alexandrova and Fabian argue, a common strategy towards sidestepping boundary problems with thick concepts in social science is trying to convert the thick concepts into technical terms. This strategy remains recently favored by some human intelligence researchers, which I think is what Tom was bringing up. For the sake of securing cross-culturally invariable boundaries for objects of, for the object of intelligence research, Warren and Burningham proposed that researchers should focus on an object with boundaries where boundaries are simply a matter of statistical observation, Spearman's G. What can be directly observed in cognitive test performance on very specific tasks? Sorry, what can be directly observed in cognitive test performance in cognitive tests is performance on very specific tasks, right? And you know, speaking of learning, um, perceptual and productive learning is task specific, right? Like humans are pretty good at generalizing, but just because I'm really good at catching uh, balls doesn't immediately make me also equally good at catching sticks. Um, I can transfer some of that ability, but I'm gonna have to do some additional learning. Uh, for example, one test contains up to 15 different tasks, word similarity, vocabulary, visual puzzles, symbol search, digit span, and comprehension, right? And so again, thinking about to, to Tom's point, right, we're trying to get you know away from the learned thing. Well, uh, there's reading involved, right? And if you have, say, a language disability, maybe you don't do as well on the, the word tasks, but does that mean that disabled people are dumber? I think that's uh, a strong claim I certainly wouldn't make. Uh, early on, the field struggled with empirically studying mental abilities beyond performance on very specific tasks. Spearman is credited with realizing that these problems can be sidestepped through a technical procedure, statistically estimating uh, whether hidden factor reliably co-varies with other observable performance on these tasks. Spearman's G is that hidden factor expressing, quote, shared variance against a set of interconnecting cognitive tasks, with Tom, which Tom brought up. Is reliance on G enough to eliminate reliance on ethical, social, and political values in determining the boundaries and objects of human intelligence research. Um, I'm, I'm going to claim no, probably. Uh, and I imagine these, uh, these particular researchers will claim the same thing. Uh, the strategy of relying on G at best helps with only one of the many phenomenon that interest intelligence researchers. A popular taxonomy of the field introduced by character by Carroll, sorry, uh, distinguishes three levels at which variations of performance on specific tasks occur. Uh, one, variations in general performance on all mental tasks, the love of Spearman's G. Uh, variations in performance on a specific family of mental tasks in a domain of cognitive functions, like working memory. And variance in performance on a specific task at hand, e.g. digit span, listen to and repeat the sequence of numbers. On its own, G does not adjust the boundary problems for the less general levels of the taxonomy, level two and three. As Dreary notes concerning level two, researchers disagree about the nature of the domains. They can vary in number, name, and content between samples depending on the battery applied, and there have long been worries about whether the nature of G might vary between cognitive batteries. These two less generic levels are especially relevant for comparison with machine learning benchmarks. Uh, as we will argue in section 4.1, task selection for machine learning benchmarks is value-laden in similar ways. Uh, yeah. Uh, technical considerations alone cannot resolve questions about the significance of the research. So the first IQ task was designed to help identify students with uh, learning difficulties to separate them from students of normal intelligence. Uh, other direct practical applications include labor and healthcare. These applications help determine how the boundaries of the concept of intelligence are operationalized, what counts as intelligent behavior and what does not. If we decide that, for example, intelligence should not be used to indicate health, that influences how we design tests to measure it. Thus, the values we attach to potential applications of a scientific concept influence how we design the values of that concept. Um, and it goes on. Uh, but yes. I don't think I have anything else to say about that. Um, if you are interested, uh, I'll, if you're interested in reading more about this paper, like I said, it is under review, um, presumably not in ACL conferences because those are closed review, uh, but you can definitely check it out. All right, uh, next research. So this is a white paper from uh, the Center for Technology and Democracy. This is the third time we talked about them today. Uh, and it is by uh, Minderu. I thought that was one of the author's names. I guess it's not. Um, 
Ivani Radia Dixit, uh, that's E V A N I R A D I Y A dash D I X I T, uh, from October 2022. So it's, you know, from last month, but still relevant. Uh, and it is a socio technical audit assessing police use of facial recognition. Uh, specifically, I believe this is in the UK. Um, Yes. Oh, so it's a visiting fellow at the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge. Um, so it's a pretty long white paper. As you can see, it's about 150 pages. It talks about uh, a number of different specific um, uh, examples of use of face recognition um, in uh Wales, uh, I believe this is in London, and also Wales again. Um, and yeah, so I think that it's a really good example of an audit. Uh, and I'm just gonna uh, really quickly read some of the conclusion together uh, rather than reading the whole 150 page report, but I will pop the link into the chat if you would like to read the whole thing. Um, especially given that uh, some uh, some places may be making audits mandatory. For example, the New York City proposed rule that we talked about a while ago. Um, this may be something that becomes much more common. So uh, section nine conclusion. Globally and in the UK, police forces continue to adopt and deploy facial recognition technology. We presented a socio-technical audit to evaluate the ongoing use of facial recognition. Uh, we hope that this work will lead to questions about whether police face should use facial recognition technologies at all. My stance is no. Uh, given the proliferation of these deployments, our audits have... Oh, our audit establishes a set of minimal ethical and legal standards for the governance of the technology. Uh, we found these minimum standards are not met by police forces in the three case studies we present here. We've shown police force use, how the police use the facial recognition, use of facial recognition fails to incorporate many of the known practices for the safe and ethical use of large scale data systems. This problem moves well beyond the concern of bias in facial recognition algorithms, right? So it's using the technology at all, not just that it's racist. Uh, it has been demonstrated the police use of facial recognition technology is very broad in scope and may infringe upon human rights, such as the right to privacy. By evaluating the documents that police forces make public, we've highlighted that some deployments may not be in accordance with the law or necessary in a democratic society as required by human rights law. Our results also show a plaque of proactive consultations with the public, especially marginalized communities that may be the most affected by these deployments. Additionally, police force documents are not fully accessible to people with disabilities or provided in immigrant languages. This loss of accessibility makes it difficult for certain groups to understand how facial recognition technology impacts them and seek remedy in cases of harm. We have found that much information about police use of facial recognition is kept from public view. This lack of transparency limits the external scrutiny of the police force use of facial recognition technology. For example, there's little published demographic data on arrests and outcomes. This makes it difficult to evaluate whether or not these tools perpetuate racial profiling. Transparency, however, does not equate to accountability. Oof, yee, that is, that's a point. Oh, oh, hey, Mr. Old Player. Uh, good to see you. I hope you get electricity back soon. Uh, police forces are not necessarily answerable or held responsible for facial recognition technology harms. For all three case studies and more broadly, there is no clear framework to assure accountability for the misuse or failure of facial recognition technology. There is a lack of robust redress mechanisms for individuals and communities harmed by police deployments of technology, right? So it's being used. Um, it's not necessarily being used in, in, um, agreement with human rights law, um, people aren't being told that it's being used in an accessible way, and if people are harmed, they, they don't have a lot of recourse. Um, so the specific recommendations they have is, uh, one, use this audit to scrutinize police use of facial recognition, right? They're doing it, they're doing it a lot, particularly in the, the three places evaluated. Uh, evaluate the use of biometric technologies in other contexts and regions, uh, including outside the UK and in the global south, which I think is you know, super important. 
uh, and join calls for a ban on police use of facial recognition in public spaces. Uh, this audit shows that some facial recognition deployments fail to meet minimum ethical and legal standards. We highlight a lack of A, evidence for a lawful interface with privacy rights, B, transparent evaluations of discrimination, C, measures for remedy for harmed persons, and D, regular oversight from an independent ethics body and the wider community. Moreover, the current legal framework for governing facial recognition is not fit for purpose. The existing legal framework is insufficient to protect against the harms of facial, rec facial recognition technology used by police forces. Given this existing regulatory gap, again, this is in the UK context, and the failure to meet minimum standards, we support calls for a ban on police use of facial recognition in public accessible, publicly accessible spaces. So, um, yeah, big study draws on, you know, several different um, instances it seem to be a lot of problems with the way it's being done. And uh, in light of those, they call for bans. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested, uh, I pop the link in the chat and feel free to check that out. All right. Uh, so speaking of normative uh, uh, measures, uh, this is a uh, paper from Perspectives on Psychological po Science published by SAGE, um, published 2022. Is there a better date than that? Just 2022? All right, published 2022. Uh, and it is titled The Myth of Normal Reading by Falk Udig and Fernanda Ferreria. Uh, that's F-A-L-K-H-U-E-T-T-I-G. Uh, yeah. Uh, might add this paper to Wikipedia. I found a lack of research on CCTV and surveillance. Oh, yeah, please do. I'm sure they'd be delighted. Uh, and thanks for joining, Tom. Uh, and Fernanda Ferreria is F E R N A N D A F E R R E I R A. So those are the researchers if you would like to check it out. Um, and uh, I've mentioned, I don't think I mentioned today um, that I'm dyslexic and I thought this article was particularly interesting because uh, usually, you know, there's this model of disability called like the lack model of disability where the focus is on what folks can't do. Um, and yeah, let's just read the abstract. We argue that the educational and psychological sciences must embrace the diversity of reading rather than chase the phantom of normal reading behavior. Uh, the phantom of normal reading behavior is my Scooby-Doo ghost villain, if I were going to be one. Uh, we critically discuss the research practice of asking participants in experiments to read normally. We then draw attention to the large cross-cultural and linguistic diversity around the world and consider the enormous diversity of reading situations and goals. Finally, we observe that people bring a huge diversity of brains and experiences to the reading task. This leads to four implications. First, there are important lessons for how to conduct psycholinguistic experiments. Um, and this is what really appealed to me because one of my research interests in graduate school was the effect of tasks on the data collected. Uh, second, we need to move beyond Anglo-centric reading research and produce models of reading that reflect the large cross-cultural diversity of languages and types of writing systems. Yes, down with Anglo-centrism, she said in English. Uh, third, we must acknowledge that there are multiple ways of reading and reasons for reading, and none of them is normal or better or a gold standard. And fourth, we must stop stigmatizing individuals, 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 uh, who read differently and for different reasons, and there should be increased focus on teaching the ability to extract information relevant to the person's goals. What is important is not how well people decode written language and how fast people read, but what people comprehend given their own stated goals. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hadn't thought about reading in this way before, and uh, I read uh, a little bit of this paper and I was like, yeah, <laughs> that is a great way of thinking about reading. I need to consider this. Um, Oh, and I should say that it looks like uh, the institutional affiliations here are the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, uh, Radboud University, Niemgen, N-I-G-J-M-E-G-E-N, one of those words that I've read a lot and never had to say aloud, uh, and uh, UC Davis, University of California Davis. Where I believe even now graduate workers are on strike, so uh, solidarity with them. Yeah. Um, uh, 
I'm having a hard time formulating thoughts and also reading right now because my brain is tired. Uh, anyway, the, the whole point of the paper is that normal reading is not a thing that exists. Um, we argue that there is no such thing as standard, average, typical, or healthy reading, and that the concept of normal reading is best confined to the dustbin of history in the educational and psychological sciences. Um, and I think the, the, the general point that they're making here is, you know, people are different. They have lots of different reasons for doing things and lots of different ways of being in the world. Um, and that usually when people are reading something, they are doing it for a reason. And the thing that defines whether or not they did a good job reading is could they do the thing that they were trying to do and not how fast did they read, uh, right? Or how many of the words did they get right? Um, which, you know, when, I, when I'm reading, I'm usually reading to try and get the content and understand it. Um, and, you know, particularly in a situation like this, also synthesize it for you. So my reading goal is not to read all the words right, right? Like you can, uh, if you are watching this, you can read on the screen. I don't need to read the things to you. Um, my goal is to pick out the parts that are the most relevant and to, you know, place it in context for you to help you think about it to help me think about it right like this is also uh broadening for me in mind stuff ideas oh, i'm tired <laughs> um yeah uh and they also and i love you know, you know me i'm a sucker for when people talk about linguistic diversity uh particularly if they're like not you know pure linguisty linguists um so one thing that they bring up here is like, hey, there's a lot of different writing systems. You have alphabets, you have syllabaries. So a syllabary is um, a writing system where each uh, symbol represents a syllable, um, probably most famously Korean Hangul. Um, Logo syllabaries, uh, e.g. Chinese, use logograms for their syllabic and semantic, semantic values, right? So uh, a Chinese character may be, um, I'm not going to get into the morphology of Chinese because it's one of those, you know, um, contentious, contentious areas of research. Um, but yes, <laughs> very complex writing system. Uh, augmented alphabets like Coptic use characters for individual segments as well as some syllables. Uh, abjads, A-B-J-A-D-S. This is not uh, a term I knew before. Um, for example, for Arabic and Hebrew, use characters for constant only. Vowels have to be inferred for, by the reader. Uh, and that makes sense for languages like Arabic and Hebrew because they have vowel harmony. So you only sort of have to know one of the values and the vowels and you can figure out the rest because they rhyme, to put it simply. Uh, abugadas, abu a-B-U-G-I-D-A-S, uh, like uh, Devangari used to write Hindi, use characters to encode a consonant with an inherent vowel and diacritics modifying the vowel. They therefore encode uh, syllabic and subsyllabic information simultaneously. Uh, even within these main script categories, there's huge div diversity. Orthographic uh, writing systems can either be orthographically transparent, like Italian, or orthographically opaque, like English, right? So Italian is very phonetic if you uh, know what each of the letters mean and if you know what each of the letters sound like you can look at a word and sound it out correctly um, not the case with English right like uh, this could be this word O-P-A-Q-U-E could absolutely say opaque um, not how it's said but it could be said that way and you have to sort of memorize which random syllable of letters so sequence of letters goes to which um, you know which word. Uh, anyway, uh, so their point is that like, hey, reading looks very, very different depending on your writing system. Uh, and English is not a good, uh, hi Curtis, you're all welcome. And English is not a good, uh, you know, proxy for all of the world's languages. So you can't just count things in English and be like, that's it, that's the thing. Um, the consequences that findings from the reading of English do not necessarily generalize and are not necessarily relevant across the diversity of writing systems found in the world. This may seem like an obvious or trivial point, yet the Anglocentrism of the, a lot of reading research remains a significant problem. Um, 
So, yeah. Uh, overall, a great point. Um, a very broadening uh, piece, which I very much enjoyed reading. Uh, and I will pop this in the chat as well if you're interested in reading the rest of it. All right. Next up, we have actually this is the last article that we had. So I think I think we might be able to do it in under two hours today. <laughs> uh, except it's very long. <laughs> it's a thesis. It's a master's thesis. Um, it's from the University of G R O N I N G E N. I think I tried to say that on stream the other week, and I definitely got it wrong. Um, growing again. Apologies, I'm so sorry. Uh, and it is by Arisha Herigers. Again, apologies if I'm saying things wrong, I almost certainly am. Uh, A-A-R-I-C-I-A-H-E-R-Y-G-E-R-S. Um, and it is on bias in Flemish speech recognition. And the title is... Uh, in Flemish, <laughs> if I had to guess, maybe Sprakerkenning uh, Waista, possibly. Uh, so maybe something like speaker understanding, possibly. Uh, what is that, maybe? Just based on knowing some kind of related languages. Uh, but I thought it was particularly interesting to me, and I don't know, maybe to you, uh, because ASR, bias in ASR systems was one of my key research areas in graduate school. Um, you may notice that a lot of the papers that we read have things to do with my areas and my research areas in graduate school. Uh, it will shock you to learn that that is something that, uh, those are things that interested me then, and they continue to interest me now. Uh, but a lot of the work has been done on English, and it's really nice to see something on a smaller language, um, so specifically here, uh, Flemish, which has, oh, uh, one sec. Let's, is there a section on Flemish? I would imagine not. Uh, I'm just on Wikipedia here. Uh, a low Franconian dialect cluster of the Dutch language. It is sometimes referred to as Flemish Dutch and Belden Dutch. Uh, 6.5 million native speakers. Um, and it is, uh, like third cousin or something to English. It's fairly closely related to English. Um, Flemish is native to Flanders, a historical region in northern Belding, Belgium. It is spoken by Flemings, the dominant ethnic group of the region. So that is about Flemish. Uh, yeah, and I'm just going to pop right down to the results. Um, so this was a... Uh, Sounds like two two models were used here. One was just an acoustic model, uh, the other one using a recurrent neural network and language model rescoring. Uh, and there's also going to be an in-depth phoneme analysis. Oh, music to my ears. Who doesn't love an in-depth phoneme analysis? Uh, phonemes are the um, commonly accepted smallest unit of uh, language sounds, right? So ah would be a phoneme. Um, I think that's an okay way of describing it that's not going to get too many people angry at me. Uh, yeah, so let's look at some tables. So uh, here we ha look at uh, bias. So we're looking at word error rate percentage. So higher is worse. You want it to be low. Uh, for red speech across native speaker age groups and variation, uh, average indicates the weighted average and average weight indicates the weighted average. I don't know what those letters stand for. <laughs> uh... Okay, so we've got West Flemish and Brabantian, I'm guessing. Okay, so it sounds like the things in the groups here are uh, different language varieties. And then uh, what are these down here? The NC, NY, and NOA? In this setting, it's probably not North Carolina and New York. Uh, let's see, NC. <laughs> Was it introduced as an acronym? No, it was not. All right. Uh, all right. 
What if I do spaces around it? Okay, what if I do just a space before it? Native children. Okay, so we have children, youngsters, and native older adults. Okay, so we have age and then dialect. Let's go back to this. Uh, okay, so what we see is not surprisingly, uh, adults have the best uh, overall system performance. Um, children have the worst and youngsters are sort of in between. Uh, children tend to be a lot more variable. There tends to be, you know, their voices are higher and quieter, so there tends to be a worse signal to noise ratio. Uh, and looking across these groups, it looks like the E and B groups had uh, better overall word error rates and the L and W groups had worse word error rates. Uh, so this is just for the acoustic model. And then here is for HMI. So I'm guessing that this is red speech and this is human machine interaction. Um, so probably more conversational, unscripted. Uh, and it looks like, wow, it's much worse at this sort of potentially unscripted speech. Um, and there's also a performance difference in gender where it looks, and eh, that's not that big. Um, a 2.3% bias against male speech was found in red speech and a 0.77% bias against female speech for HMI. Given that those biases are both quite small and in different directions, I would say that this is probably not that big not not representing of a real substantial difference, um, given that, however, that these patterns of younger speakers faring worse, uh, and also specifically these W and L dialect region speakers faring worse are the same across these different models, I would say that that is indicative probably of, uh, of a difference between those groups. Uh, yeah, and then we have non-native children and native children. So again, as I would sort of expect based on other research, we have uh, worse, uh, so non-native children and non-native adults, I'm guessing is that what that is? We have worse performance for children across the board than adults. Uh, not a huge gender difference that I'm seeing. Uh, and not a consistent one, so maybe kind of a little one, but yeah, interesting. Uh, and then the, a bunch more results breaking out, broken out, uh, and then non-native bias, uh, which uh, is something else that tends to not be super well studied, uh, but it looks like non-native children were recognized with 11% uh, worse. Um, Age bias is pretty much the same, uh, that sort of general pattern. So yeah, interesting. Uh, ooh, and here is the phoneme error analysis that I promised. Wow, that's a lot of vowels I'm not gonna be able to say, right? Cool. <laughs> uh, so the vowels that had the greatest uh, phoneme error rate are this one, which I think is like a, uh, this one, one sec, I'm just gonna, just gonna, just gonna grab a, just gonna grab an IPA chart real quick, real quick IPA chart, okay, uh, so IPA is the International Phonetic Alphabet, I know it means other things as well, but that's how I mean it, uh, and this, get bigger, and over and down. There we go. Um, so this is what I was looking for, uh, so the way that you read this chart is, we talked about this before on the channel. Imagine the mouth like so. So things towards this uh, I here, which is uh, said E, uh, is upper front. Uh, and it means that my tongue root is up and forward. And this uh, ah back here down at the bottom, the like fat A, uh, means my tongue root is down and back. Uh, and the relationship between the I and the Y here is that the I is unrounded and the Y is rounded. So E, 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 E. Um, that second sound is not one that we have in English. Uh, okay, so we've got my IPA chart here and let's look at the ones that are specifically uh, here. Okay, so here we have this E vowel that we don't have in English. Uh, we have it as part of a diphthong like A, but E, uh, certainly in American English, is not really a thing. So a lengthened 
sorry, the two little dots mean that it is long. So a uh, lengthened closed mid front vowel. Uh, we have this little Y looking doodly oop, which is here. So this is an unrounded uh, closed mid back vowel. So it'd be like, uh, so, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, this is the oh sound that we do have in English. Um, at the beginning of the diphthong O, oh, for example. But the unrounded vowel of that, which we don't have in English. Uh, schwa, which is just uh, uh, I don't know about Flemish in particular, but in English, most unstressed syllables, the vowel turns into an uh. I think this is eh, but let me double check. Nope. There we go. Eh. Let me double check. Is that written? Sorry, the thing is, I'm not entirely sure if it's the central or the front version. Which direction was it pointing? Eh, okay, so it is the uh, it is the the front version, and this is a vowel that we do have in English, and it is eh as in bet. So those are the most commonly uh, the phonemes that had the highest error rate. Uh, and it looks like it's pretty consistent across dialects. Uh, so for some of them we have here, this is ah, uh, huh as in aha, uh t as in a ta. Uh, but generally it tends to be these vowels, which are all unrounded uh, and are all, nope, uh, all sort of pretty close to each other in the middle of the vowel space as well. Um, so I see how you could get, uh, you know, how those could be confusable. Uh, maybe even listening to them, they sound might have sounded quite alike to you. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't look like there's any strong differences between them. So uh, there are no clear differences in the recognition of certain phonemes across regions, genders, air, age groups, or native versus non-native speakers, which is a really cool and interesting uh, uh, really cool and interesting finding to have, particularly because it suggests that, you know, perhaps these non-native speakers are being able to produce these vowels in a fairly native-like way, uh, or at least native-like enough that the same sort of errors tend to get made. So, interesting work on Flemish. Um, I like seeing the phoneme error rate analysis. Uh, it looks like there is, you know, uh, bias against specific regions, which, uh, you know, bad <laughs> if i had to guess the regions that had the the best uh performance probably are the regions that have the most money and political influence that tends to be how it goes um yeah cool work uh and congrats to uh arishia on uh the master's uh thesis all right I said I was gonna do it in under two hours and I think I'm about to just do it. Fun, I only have one thing, <laughs> but I thought it was fun. Um, so this is a dev.2 piece and I'll paste it, paste it in, the, uh, in the chat as well if you wanna check it out. Uh, but basically uh, this is from Renato Lozio, uh, L-O-S-I-O. Uh, on Dev.2, how to cook a Thanksgiving turkey according to Amazon recognition. Um, and I will say the reason that we're not going to have stream next week is because it is Thanksgiving here in the US, which is a holiday. So I, sh I shan't be around. I will be holidaying. Um, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just not going to be doing this. Anyway, uh, I thought it was a uh, Fairly funny because the uh, uploaded uh, some pictures from WikiHow and then used this uh, image labeling and recognition uh, system to uh, label the uh, the pictures, right? So here it's a soccer ball and here it's a chicken uh, and here the oven is labeled as a dishwasher uh, and here, here the turkey is labeled as a cat, which is um, not, not the case, right? Um, yeah, here it's labeled as a bread, and the uh, meat thermometer is labeled as dynamite. Uh, and finally, the finished roast turkey is uh, labeled as pork. Um, so particularly just funny, right? Uh, uh, just a, a funny example of a system not working particularly well in a particular domain. And I thought it was silly, so I shared it. All right, I think we're gonna do it. I think we're gonna get in under two hours. My voice is going, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. 
Ooh, that felt like a race. I was, I was just like sprinting through each of those. Um, hopefully you kept up with me. And before I call it for the uh, day, uh, I do want to say thank you to my wonderful coffee supporters. And I did have a bunch more links that I didn't end up talking about. Uh, and if you are a coffee supporter, you have gotten all of those links in the links that went out today. So you have everything, even if I didn't talk about it. Um, and thank you very much to all of these wonderful folks who helped to support me uh, and the channel and make this possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, Zach says, uh, me and my wife say so-called machine learning for things like that. Um, yes, that is uh, uh, precisely so, right? Like. It gave you an output. Um, it was also very, uh, very certain about that output, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, so the soccer ball here, this frozen turkey being labeled as a soccer ball was 99.7% uh, uh, accuracy. She's a machine learning researcher. Yep, or was. Yeah, I do feel like machine learning researchers are among, well, unless they're trying to get people to give them money, uh, tend to be the most, uh, accurately um, skeptical of systems. Um, oh, and if any of you would like all the links uh, and would like to be a coffee supporter, um, it's down there. I can never remember which way I'm pointing. Uh, RC, sorry, nope. ko-fi.com slash r-c-t-a-t-m-a-n. Hey, it's me. Um, yeah, and uh, you can see that the links for this morning are up, but you have to subscribe to see them. Well, um, it's the, the minimum is a dollar a month. I tried to make it uh, very, um, very accessible for folks uh, and still be able to pay for the software that I'm using to do this. So um, thank you very much to all my supporters. Again, I really appreciate you all. Uh, I appreciate all of you watching as well. I just appreciate my supporters a little bit more. <laughs> uh, and I am gonna wrap it up here for the day. Um, Yes, so next Tuesday we'll be back for stream. No stream on Thursday. I may or may not have a little something going on on Thursday anyway so that you don't uh, you don't feel too bereft without me. Uh, and that's all I've got for today. So have a great weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.